So welcome everybody to Webinar Wednesday from Sight and Sound Technology. My name is Stuart Lawler. And as always, my colleague Carl Braley is with me and we're delighted to be back with you for another week. Now, today's session is actually the first of two. Uh, just in case you're wondering, we do have a, a, another webinar this evening at 7 p.m. Uh, talking about all that's new in the latest version of JAWS 2021, which um, came out last week. So uh, just to say there is another webinar later on this evening. But this afternoon, we're delighted to talk all things Braille. And this is an event that I actually wanted to run for a number of months and that I spoke to our panelists about. It seems like a long time ago. It took us a while to get this set up, but we're delighted to be here today. And we have three wonderful panelists who we're going to hear from in just a moment. I should say that when I asked each of them without any hesitation, they straight away said yes. They are passionate Braille users and researchers and are really driving Braille forward as a code and a platform for us all to use. So we'll go to our panel in just a second, but before that, of course, we would like to hear from you today. Your voice is crucial as part of Webinar Wednesday. And you can do that on the Zoom platform by raising your hand, by pressing Alt and Y um, on uh, the computer, on um, Windows, or if you're using the um, if you're using one of the um, mobile platforms, you can activate the raise hand uh, button. You can also type in the chat window by pressing Alt and H or activating the chat option on your mobile app of choice. If you are using the chat feature, please make sure you send your message to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can get to see your message. Um, and Carl will be doing as he, what he always does best, keeping an eye on all the goings on in our chat window and our raised hand. We have three presentations this afternoon and we're going to hold our questions and comments until after all three, if that's okay. I've asked our presenters to speak for between 15 and 20 minutes each, so I'm looking forward to that. And speaking of our presenters, I thought to start off the session, we would ask them just to briefly um, say something and uh, tell us a little about themselves. So we're going to start with Sheila O'Moran, who is all the way over in Michigan and starting her day with a webinar Wednesday. So Sheila, we will say hello and good morning. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon to you. Um, I teach at the University of Michigan, where I have a joint appointment in the School of Music, Theatre and Dance, where I teach in Performing Arts Technology, and in the School of Information. And my uh, reason for being here is that I've been working for many years now on designing a new full-page tactile braille display. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, let's go over to Mr. Fitzpatrick in Balbriggan in Dublin. Good afternoon, uh, Donal. Hello, Stuart. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here on a, a windy afternoon out here in, in Balbriggan in Dublin. Uh, thank you for, for having me along, Stuart. Donald Fitzpatrick, as you say, is me. I'm a lecturer in the School of Computing in Dublin City University. And I, like you, have been working on, on, on various aspects of Braille to do with mathematics and other things. And I use it every day in my, my, my job. So that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. And let's go over to Mr. Dave Williams. And I think, uh, Dave, I never, I didn't check. I think you're near Birmingham, but you might correct me if I'm wrong. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Williams. Uh, I'm based in Worcester, which you're right, Stuart. It's just down the M5 from Birmingham. I work for the RNIB as a customer experience manager, uh, and I'm also here today to represent the Brailleists Foundation, a grassroots organisation of who I am the chair. I'm a blind dad and uh, really looking forward to this session. Thank you very much, uh, Dave, and thank you to all our panelists again for joining us today. All right, we're going to start right into the presentations. As I say, we will have lots of time for questions and answers, and I know there's lots of people who have been asking and talking about this session. Um, it's one of the most popular that we've run, and I've had a lot of people asking me about it in the last few days, so it's great to see such a, um, a, such a high number of people here. So I'm going to start again with ladies first, and we're going to go back over to Michigan. And Sheila, the floor is yours. And again, thank you very much. OK, I'm going to just share my PowerPoint. So hopefully, Is that OK? Perfect. So I'm also a Braille user. I just wanted to point that out because um, that I think makes a difference when we talk about um, who's involved in the design process, because I think uh, more and more people are realizing that we do better when we have visually impaired people and 
uh, involved right from the beginning of the design process and particularly when we talk about braille displays to have braille readers right there at the start. So, so the title of this talk is Designing a Full Page Tactile um, Display, What We Know and What We Don't Know Yet. And I want to talk about uh, three studies that we've been involved in over the last number of years that, I mean, we have been developing a full page tactile display, uh, certainly, but that's kind of quite technical. And what's I think more interesting is the things that we've been doing on the interaction side, because that I think is where, you know, most people are going to meet the tactile display. How good is it at doing its job, basically? And what are the things that are important to research as we design and develop these things? So the first question is, how much display is enough? How many dots are enough? That's an, a question I'll explain later. And then finally, some larger questions about how you interact with a full page tactile display, because it's quite different to interacting with a single line display. And then I'll just summarize things. So how much display is enough? Well, this was a sort of a Mythbusters exercise. And I think if any of you have ever come across, I don't know if some of you might have come across the uh, things like tactile mice uh, from VTech, I think, was one of them. And it, it was a mouse, basically, with a couple of braille cells on the top. And the idea was that you could move the mouse around and the letters you wanted would appear as you did so. And everybody thought, well, this is great because it's only two braille cells. It's going to be really cheap and it's going to be easy to get to people. But blind people didn't like it. And, um, I, you know, we had a hunch why. But yet every conference we went to, sighted people come up and say, well, why don't we just make a, a single cell display because you only ever touch one or two cells with your fingers at a time and we were like oh okay we need to do a myth busting exercise here so we we set about creating equivalents of a couple of different things we felt we had a hunch that the reason the mouse didn't work was because it was important to be able to slide your finger over braille that actually that made a big difference in how well you could read it uh, and we said that maybe it's the actual slip between your finger and the braille that's important or maybe it's because you can move your arm so we kind of built, built a whole bunch of devices to test this. We had a single cell that just popped up underneath your finger like a kind of a clock might. Then we had the mouse equivalent where the cell stayed the same, but you moved your arm. And then we had a regular display where you moved your finger like you normally would. And then we had a display where you, your finger sat still, but the s display slipped under your finger, so you only had slip. And our hunch was that the best performance would be from the regular display um, and that the other... the uh, other display where uh, you kept your finger still and the braille slid underneath it would be the next best because that preserved the sliding um, effect. So what did we find? Well, we actually found that was true, that the best performance in our test where we had people reciting random characters that popped on, up under their fingers, um, the best performance was when they could read the characters themselves. And the second best was when the characters slid under their finger <clears throat> Excuse me. And the two conditions where the cell stayed still and the, the dots just popped up and down were the worst. So we said, OK, well, then sliding contact is important because that would suggest that um, you can't just have single braille cells, that the, at least a line is important. Um, and then that would give us some um, grounds for suggesting that probably a full page was going to be successful for the same reason that you need to be able to explore the text yourself and not have it just appear under your finger by magic. So yes, our results just showed uh, little significance for the um, conditions where the, the braille slid onto the finger or you slid your finger across the braille. So the ne next thing we looked at was, okay, so what if we make a braille display that's full page, but we also want to do graphics. And the challenge here is that um, if braille dots are a particular size and they're separated by a particular distance. So if you want to get small so you can do really high definition graphics, something's going to have to give. And it might be that you have to make smaller braille dots. Um, and if you do, then you're going to have what we call pokey braille when you go to label your diagram. So your diagrams might look really nice, but then you're going to, you can't just summon up regular braille dots uh, on demand to label wherever you want on your on your screen. So we said, OK, so are people going to care about smaller braille or do people want the same size braille or could we make uh, sort of blobs of braille out of lots and lots of little dots if we had a really, really high density display? And so we tested that and some images on the slide here which show how we made different 
blob shaped braille things to, to test to see if we had lots and lots of dots. If we made up blobs that kind of resemble the shape of braille, would people like those? Or would they prefer sort of pokey dots um, for small braille or pokey dots for regular size braille? And what we discovered is people preferred to keep the size of the braille and the number of dots, and they were okay with the dots being very skinny and pokey. So that's nice because it suggests that if we get to a point where we can do really high resolution braille displays, that we still have a way of labeling these displays that people are happy with. So then um, we started to move on to some questions about, well, you know, the difference between a single cell or a single line display and a, and a full page display is quite significant. And it poses a lot of new challenges, which is how do you orient yourself on a full page display? Because on a single line, you have the cursor rooting buttons and you can bring the cursor to you and you just reach up above the cell and, and the cursor comes. Um, but on a full page tactile array, we're not going to be able to get all those cursor buttons in amongst all the dots. Um, it's possible that the dot, well, it's likely that the dots themselves will become the cursor buttons because we can fi figure out where your finger is. But then the question is, how do you find the cursor on the display? And so the, the, th the thing is here, as the size of the tactile array increases from a single line to a full page, um, it's going to be harder to find things on the display. And therefore, we're going to have to come up with different strategies for making sure that people always stay oriented. And these might include strategies for panning and zooming what's on the display, uh, as well as just finding the cursor. So one thing that comes to the fore immediately as you start to think about this is the difference between the way that vision works and the way that touch works. So if you think about it, when somebody who's sighted looks at a screen, they see all the information on the screen and then they kind of focus in on what they want to look at. So they get the sort of what we call the context uh, when they look at the screen and then the focus is where they're going to look with their eyes to, to actually edit a piece of text or click on an icon or whatever it is they're doing. But when you put your hand down on a braille display, you start out with focus. So the, the first thing you notice is what's immediately under your hand. And then you have to kind of build up the rest of the image of the display by moving your hands around. So it's not that you don't get to understanding the same information, but you kind of do it the opposite way out. So in vision, you start with context and go and focus in. And the, the, with touch, you tend to put your fingers down. You have focus first, and then you gather the context. And the result is that the strategies for designing content for these displays might be quite different. It might be the case that you can't just copy the screen and put it on the tactile display. You might have to do something very different to make it work well. And, and so the, the, again, just another way to point it out is that for um, sighted people, um, you look at the screen and you have a mouse and you drag the cursor to where you need it. But for us, we put down our fingers and we want the cursor to come to us because we don't want to have to go and find it and bring it. We just want to be able to summon it to our underneath our finger. And this is one of the consequences of the, the difference between the two. This is just a, an image for those who, who might have been unfamiliar with a braille display with cursor rooting on it just for the buttons. And it just says that vision equals context first, touch equals focus first. And the fa uh, just iterating the fact that each gives rise to a very different strategy for interacting with information. So the things that arise then because of this is that you might need a different approach to attracting attention. And we've tried a couple of different things. Um, and we're not working so much with our own display at the moment because it's, it's um, getting better, but it's still only small. <laughs> um, um, so we've been working with the graffiti to try out some of these strategies. So we can do things like we can have dots blink. Um, the graffiti has the ability to make dots higher or lower. So we've looked at that as a way of making, uh, differentiating between different kinds of information on the display. And then we can think of things like overlays or grids, which might help somebody orient themselves on a, a graph or a chart or a map. Things that could be temporarily summoned up to help you find your way around and then kind of dismissed as you don't need them anymore. And the other thing to note is that the approach you use is going to depend on the kind of content that you have. So for instance, um, you know, braille text or graphics are kind of static content. So, you know, you can do something, um, you can set up your context and focus to work with a, a static diagram or a, a page of braille. 
and that's okay for reading text and exploring tactile graphics. But then when we get to things like what we call dynamic content, which is content that can change under your finger, things that can refresh more like a regular computer screen, then you know, that's a different set of, of things that we might do, want to do. And then if we get to the point where we're generating content, so you're creating your own text and editing your own text, or even creating and editing your own graphs and charts and drawings, then there are more um, ways we'll have to think about interacting so that you always know where you are and you always know what you've done. And then you can go beyond text and graphics to do things like editing sound, for instance. Uh, which involves a whole different set of strategies for managing to know where you are and to manipulate the information under the cursor. So one could say that there are more challenges than there are with single line displays, but there are also more advantages because you can support working with non-textual information such as graphs and charts and maps. And you can even start to think finally about doing collaborative document editing. So if two people like a sighted person or a blind, and a blind person have a document open, finally you can start to see where somebody else is working to avoid them. And it, we're not going to have this situation where the screen reader is always trying to grab focus and trying to tell you where the other person's cursor is while you're trying to work on your own piece of text, which is really frustrating because uh, traditional screen readers were never designed to work in an environment with multiple cursors doing different things. So it's such a paradigm shift that um, they have never really been able to catch up with it. And so we think things like being able to, for instance, put some of that information on the tactile display might really help. So um, another sort of way of thinking of this is to, to think about what touch is good for and what um, speech is good for. And one of the things we've been doing recently is working with different uh, kinds of applications where we can start to distribute content in different ways. So we've been doing uh, work with crossword puzzles, for instance, where the grid, the crossword grid is actually on the tactile display, but the letters and the words are spoken so that, um, you know, Braille takes up a lot more than one uh, dot. So you can get um, quite cluttered quite quickly and it become, can become quite hard to find your way around. But you could do this thing, and this is also relevant for non-Braille readers too, that you could have a spatial layout of your regular crossword and you can see where the blanks and the, the cells you filled are. And then you can go tap on those individual squares to find out if they're empty or full. And then you can put the letters in yourself. So we did a, um, a little study with um, some users using uh, a version of a crossword that we'd made for the graffiti where we did exactly that. We had the crossword layout um, on, in dots on the graffiti, but then the words were spoken so that you could actually enter text um, using a braille keyboard uh, or a, a QWERTY keyboard. And we compared that against um, a screen reader where basically you had to kind of negotiate the text using the cursor, uh, or you could just move between the clues and the grid by doing a, um, a sort of a tab. And so uh, what we found was that where we gave people the spatial information, they actually remembered where things were on the grid. But when they just had the screen reader version, they just answered the clues. So it just became like a regular old puzzle. They never got the satisfaction of seeing where the words inter intersected or figuring out how, you know, where the blanks were and, and filling them in, in in a kind of spatial way. So that just gives us some hint that being able to do this might actually provide a, a different interaction, a way of interacting with spatial information that preserves the spatial nature of the task. And then just to finishing up, so just some um, sort of things that are also going to be useful. The tactile images, uh, if you can create and edit tactile images on these things, then they can be uploaded and shared so that they can be made available on demand, which I think will be really helpful for teachers eventually so that you could um, generate a tactile image and share it with multiple students and you could certainly do it um, in, in a more timely manner. And, oh sorry, uh, then you can also pan and zoom information so you can have a much more interactive um, experience. Uh, and you can generate and, and manipulate your own images so students can create uh, and label their own graphs, which as you know has been a nightmare. And then you can also do some freehand drawing and just some kind of fun stuff, which for younger children I think might be really helpful as well. 
and this is just a reference to a paper um, that uh, where some people had explored that kind of interaction with the hyperbrow. So to summarize this section on interaction, um, the transition from a single line to a full page uh, braille display is kind of as significant for us blind people as the transition from the command line to the GUI was for sighted people. And in the same way as the GUI, the graphical user interface required people to really rethink how they interacted with information uh, for sighted people, it's also going to require us, um, this full page paradigm is going to require us to really rethink everything from the ground up as well. And just to summarize then, tactile interaction is focused before context. Larger displays means more items to be searched, so different strategies. And um, then managing and attracting attention is going to be different. Um, and finally, different tasks and contexts are going to require different kinds of approaches. And so um, then, uh, just to, uh, in summary then, the, as I say, this transition to the full page tactile array and the, appro uh, the associated design changes that are going to um, be required uh, are going to require a lot of um, assistance from people who are experienced in understanding tactile language. And so it's going to be really important that, you know, as we go through this process that we engage people who are blind, people who are transcribers, people who teach and develop um, tactile materials at all levels to really make sure we get this right and do it well. So just to acknowledge a bunch of people, um, that my co-founders in our little company, New Haptics, um, Alex Rosamano, Bernd Gillespie, my former colleague, Val Morris, who passed away uh, a number of years ago, who worked on the DOT study with us, um, and my student, Rishikesh Rao, who's the person that did the crossword study. And I just have to point out conflict of interest because um, being a member of the company, you know, I just, I'm, I'm required to put this on the slide, so I do. So, thank you very much. Sheila, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And I suppose I'm very excited that the thoughts of being able to edit audio with a full page braille display. Wow, it's very exciting. So thank you very much for that. Okay, um, let's go to, uh, Mr. Donald Fitzpatrick, uh, who is in Dublin, and I know one of the conversations we've been having many times is about accessible mathematics and making something that has been challenging for lots of people more accessible. So the floor is yours, Ed, and uh, thank you very much, Donald. Thanks very much, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've always been a Braille reader. Uh, ever since the, the the dim dark days in the past, when my mum actually brailed out my Irish books in the Vale School and the Irish School in, in in Rathcool, and over the years, one of the biggest challenges I faced in both education and professional activities was access to mathematics. And I was very taken by a comment that that Sheila passed in the opening of of, of her presentation, where she said that it's very important to have blind people involved in design of things. I'm paraphrasing, but of, of things for blind people. And the project I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is called the Euromath Project. And what was really fantastic about this was the fact that myself here in Dublin and one of the lead developers in our partner in, in Warsaw, in, 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 in Poland, uh, both were blind. So we brought um, our own lived experience uh, to the project, which was really, really good because uh, we could, in that point, we, we, we could do things like, you know, bounce ideas off each other and see how we would do things. And frequently it was quite interesting. We were, we were very much differing in how we approached reading or interacting or doing different things in, ma in mathematics. So it made for a very interesting discussion. But if I can go back to the start of the project, the objective was, uh, the project was, was led by uh, our colleagues at NASK, which is a Polish research institution. And way back about five, six years ago, they had developed a suite of Windows applications called the Platmat suite of applications. And they had a calculator, an old style. Here, I'm going to take people back. Uh, younger part participants in this webinar won't know what we're talking about, maybe. Uh, a cube rhythm board. Many people will remember a cube rhythm board. They had an electronic one uh, done as a grid. They had various applications for, for writing, 
and for reading and for editing mathematics, all done in Windows and all designed to accommodate the Polish education system. They subsequently translated those into English and using some UEB. And the objective was then to actually make the project, make the PlatMat suite of tools more useful in the wider context of other partner countries, which were ourselves here in Dublin and our colleagues at Visio in the Netherlands. So there were three partners, us, Visio, and the coordinator at NASK. So the first thing we did uh, was we took a look at the various education systems. You know, how is mathematics taught in Ireland, Poland, the Netherlands, and neighboring countries? And we produced a report on that. And it was really, really interesting because some countries, i.e. the Netherlands, were very much digitally oriented. They focused on uh, almost like a text-based notation. They used things like Excel, they used Word to actually convey mathematics. It was very much a text-based notation and no paper was involved at all. In Ireland and uh, in, in, in Poland, it was kind of a hybrid approach um, where we used a mixture of electronic refreshable braille displays in schools and a lot of paper. Uh, as people will, who, who are based in Ireland will know, uh, many students still get books in, in paper form. So the presentation of the material on paper was still a very, very important aspect of it. And again, it goes back to something Sheila said, which is that some people just like the fact, particularly for mathematics, you have a two-dimensional space. The equation is laid out in a space on a sheet of paper. So we looked at the curriculum in all the various countries. We looked at the topics. We looked at how, how mathematics was taught. And what became apparent is that we had to do a complete rethink of, of what we were about to do. So our colleagues in Warsaw bit the bullet and came up with a, a web-based application, which was to operate in a browser, which meant that it would, be work, would work on Windows, on Braille note takers, such as the Braille note touch, some of the HIMSS products uh, and other things. We rapidly came to the conclusion that there was no point in forcing people to learn a whole new skill in order to interact with our application. I've seen and used things in the past where I've had to completely abandon, for example, my screen reader in order to use an application with the keyboard shortcut. So memorize on top of my screen reader, memorize keyboard shortcuts. And while we couldn't get away from that entirely, um, we took the view that anything we developed should work insofar as was possible with the technology that people actually used. And again, from our initial report, we established that the, the, the kinds of technology that, that particularly children in the classes were actually using. So we made the decision to go with a web-based product. And unfortunately, I'll just say here that the project is now completed and uh, we're moving the entire Euromath infrastructure online uh, to hopefully a server uh, supplied by, by DCU. It's currently in one in, in, in Warsaw and the resources aren't there to maintain it long, long term. So I apologize that I can't actually show it to you today. It's, it's currently in the process of migrating, which is truly unfortunate. But we built an editor essentially. And for all the world, it looks and behaves very much like the traditional editors that people would use. Microsoft Word, it's got a menu bar across the top. And the keyboard shortcuts are slightly different. You know, for example, Alt-F becomes on some browsers, Alt-Shift-F, because that's the, the way we had to do it. Alt-F would go to the browser's menu. But insofar as we could, we kept the keyboard shortcuts, the things that people would actually know. One of our primary objectives in all of this was the the, the philosophy that the teacher should be able to write mathematics in their preferred notation and the blind student should be able to write in theirs. So to underpin this, what we did in DCU was we developed a translation, a little translation package, which took uh, mathematics prepared in a format called MathML, which, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, and translated it into Braille. And it also then translates from Braille back into MathML. Once we had that, we could build things, little tools on top of it. So that was the, the, the nub of the whole thing, was to actually have the underlying technology to translate from one format to another. Then we could say things like, OK, let's allow the blind student to enter using Braille. So it was, in our case, it was six dot Braille. So you could use, for example, a Braille note or a HIMSS product 
and you could use then alternatively uh, keys on a laptop keyboard, um, you know, SDF, for example, uh, and on the other side, JKNL, to enter the various dots. So that it could be entered by the, by the student in a way that suited them. The teacher could enter the equations in ASCII math or using Unicode characters, and again, have it translated into Braille. And we have used it in various studies in the, in the partner countries, and it worked very, very well. I think what we need to actually work on still is the notion that I, I, I think the user interface is, is targeted. I think if you're in secondary school, I think you'll be fine. I still think there is a gap that we have to look at which addresses the needs of younger children, particularly. Um, we have to come up with something that is very, very, very simple for a younger child to use, because I think we're going to start moving to a point now where electronic entry of mathematics in particular is going to almost, I won't say replace, but certainly become a very, very major factor in how these things, this, this particular type of work is actually done. As well as the editor and all of the, the technology that we actually did, part of our project objective was to provide some examples of how this type of information can actually be taught. So each partner had to contribute a hundred of those and they are there and they're designed, if you like, to hand to teachers who are dealing with a mainstream school situation where they might have one blind child in their class in their entire career or in a 10 year period, for example. They're not necessarily interacting with a blind child every single year. So the objective here again was to actually provide this stuff in a way that a teacher could actually search in a way that made sense to them. So we canvassed the opinion, for example, I'll give it in the Irish context, and we came up with some ways that you can actually search. So the Irish math curriculum is based on topics and within topics that are subtopics. So you can simply go to a little search facility and say, give me all worksheets to do with number and telling the time. And it will come back with any worksheets in our system, which shows how these things can actually be conveyed to uh, blind and vision impaired children. Overall, we're absolutely delighted with how it went. Uh, I'm absolutely over the moon to be able to report that we got our feedback from the Erasmus Polish National Agency of, 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 of uh, the, the administering organization, the Erasmus Plus organization in Poland. And they were delighted with the grant. So we, we, we actually got the, the, the final sign off and approval just yesterday, actually, which was, which was great news. Uh, one is always somewhat nervous when you go through these final review phases as to whether it will actually be accepted or not. So we did. Um, the results of various evaluations went, went well. We certainly have work to do to actually make it slightly more user friendly. Um, as I say, we had a gap. We have certainly got a gap in terms of how we introduce this and how we use this with, with younger children. But I'm very, very optimistic that this can be taken forward and hopefully will become used and usable by as wide a variety of teachers and students as possible. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Brilliant presentation. And uh, when you mentioned the cube rhythm uh, board there, uh, I was only talking about that to somebody last week, Donal, and uh, they're still being used. So uh, people like them. So thank you very much, Donal. I know you've been doing huge amounts of work in this area for a long time and you continue to do so. And it's great to have somebody here in Ireland who's at the heart of that stuff and making maths accessible. Okay, before we go over to um, to the Brailleists and um, uh, Mr. Dave Williams, I just want to remind people again that you can type questions into the chat area by pressing Alt and H if you wish, or activate the chat option if you're using a mobile app, or you can uh, raise your hand with Alt and Y. And we will be going to questions after our next and final presentation, which is from um, Dave Williams of the Brailleists. And Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, oh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, yes, you can still get the cube rhythm from RNIB should you wish to do so. It's lovely to be amongst people who recognize the value of Braille, not just for education, uh, the obvious things around spelling, punctuation and uh, grammar, um, but also everyone on the panel today. And I'm sure many of you recognize the value of Braille for work, making notes, proofing documents, 
uh, and being able to deliver a presentation. I think the thing that really made me sort of fall back in love with Braille after a little bit of a break, like many people, uh, my Braille withered in my teens. Uh, I felt that it was something that kind of separated me from other people and something that was uh, a kind of a negative thing for me at that stage. But when I uh, became a dad um, and needed to read the bedtime story with my sighted son, it's not his fault he's sighted, uh, we don't hold that against him, but uh, when I needed to read that bedtime story, uh, really Braille was the best tool for that job. And it really brought it home to me that actually Braille enables us and allows us as blind people to do more of the same things that, uh, that sighted people do uh, as well. It's a really exciting time uh, for Braille, of course, with uh, new devices, and we've heard about uh, some of the work on those in this session this afternoon, um, changing what it means to be a Braille display, uh, and also changing what you can expect to pay uh, for a Braille display has been a, a theme that has, has run uh, for the last uh, few years. We've also seen changes in um, content delivery systems as well. Digital Braille uh, is now widely uh, downloadable, not least of which from RNIB's uh, reading uh, services. So that's increasing access to content. And of course, the code itself, now that the English speaking world has adopted unified English Braille, that means that the code is more robust for computers to automate translation. We still need professional transcribers, of course, uh, for things like layout but it does mean that uh, with UEB now uh, teachers have a little bit more assurance that uh, when a student writes something on a braille note taker hopefully what comes out the other end is going to be readable by a sighted teacher. The Braillist Foundation started life as a focus group um, for Bristol Braille Technology, who developed the Canute 360, um, a nine-line, uh, multi-line Braille e-reader. And uh, I, I remember we, we did lots of work with, with Bristol Braille Technology, who, you know, I think Sheila and Donal um, ha have also said that really it's very difficult to develop a new Braille product without uh, blind people being directly involved and that was really where the Braillist came from. Bristol Braille Technology put the call out for blind people to come and explore the Canute and how that might uh, work and how you might use it to do things like, I don't know, a, a, a word search, vertical edition, um, display Pascal's triangle, or um, perhaps um, understand how some poetry is, is laid out, um, sports rankings and so on, all things that are um, problematic, not impossible, but uh, certainly slower when you're using um, a single line braille display. So um, we uh, worked with uh, Bristol Braille uh, technology uh, on the the Canute, which is is now available. They they did a small uh, production run, uh, and that is available. Uh, so do uh, look the Canute up. Oh, that's C A N U T E. Um, it also helped to add to that conversation uh, about how screen readers uh, tackle the whole subject of multi line Braille. I remember very clearly sitting in a meeting at uh, the California. State University Conference on Technology and Disability around the table with big tech uh, representatives, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and so on. Um, and uh, there was a discussion about the standard for plug and play Braille. So a place that the whole industry wants to get to is the ability to be able to just plug a Braille display in or connect a Braille display and it just start uh, working without you having to go and find the drivers and do lots of configuration. And uh, one of the big tech companies had been involved in leading the specification for that. Uh, and they had specified the maximum size of a braille display to be 256 characters. Uh, and somebody else from another big tech company in the room said, well, hang on a minute, why, why 256? You know, that's a, that's a computer number. It doesn't really, you know, it's kind of arbitrary when it comes to how many cells, you know, a, a braille display user might actually need. And in fact, on the table, right in the room, we have a braille display that shows 360 cells of braille, which of course was the, was the Canute. So straight away, big tech changed the spec for that and made it 300 and, uh, 256 cells per line, you know, rather than 256 cells in, in total. So these projects are so important to help move uh, that thinking on. And, and it's a privilege to be involved um, with, with some of those. 
So the Brailists, uh, while meeting to to sort of test the, the, the Canute and provide feedback for Bristol Braille technology, of course, the conversation, um, you know, broadened out more widely about, you know, the sort of the general uh, promotion of Braille, who leads uh, Braille, you know, what does uh, transcription really look like? What do you do if you have a uh, problem with uh, some Braille that's being transcribed uh, for you? So um, we recognize that our interests lay, you know, yes, in the whole area of of Braille innovation, but also in, in Braille more, more widely. Uh, so we would have many face-to-face -face meetings, uh, meeting experts who would come and explain the reasons for Unified English Braille, um, some of the challenges facing transcription, uh, and, and, and many more besides. Those meetings were in Bristol, London, Reading, uh, and over in, in Ireland. Uh, we set up an online forum and also started producing an occasional uh, podcast, uh, Braillecast, uh, which is uh, still going to this day. But then, of course, lockdown came and we were being told as blind people, you know, that you don't touch anybody. Basically, this is how this virus spreads is if you, you know, if you get too close to other other people. And clearly, you know, Braille is all about touch and learning Braille quite often is about having, you know, face to face contact with your your Braille teacher. And I would maintain that that is still probably the very best way uh, to do that where where possible. Um, but during lockdown, we engaged with a qualified teacher of the visually impaired to deliver some Braille for beginners. So these were weekly sessions for adult uh, Braille um, learners. Uh, and in addition to that, then, uh, so we started working through the fingerprint course and the group um, really took on a life of, of, of its own. And they decided um, that they wanted to set up a Braille book club to create a, a kind of a safe environment. So all of this delivered online uh, over Zoom. So, so there's a, a regular ba uh, Braille uh, book club where, where people can meet up. They can either listen or they can read aloud, but it's a safe environment where people don't feel, you know, ridiculed or under any kind of pressure pressure as they they develop their um their braille skills um and we also have provided the opportunity um for braille readers and <clears throat> other stakeholders to continue to access um braille expertise so we've you know we've had Stuart come along to one of our our stay safe um calls but we've also had uh, academics uh we've had the now chair of the international council on english braille uh, and, and and many more uh, people besides but alongside that we've also had our kind of our well-being strands so we've offered cooking and mindfulness uh, and so on. And all of this, uh, really, as we've grown uh, the Braillers Foundation has really, I think, grown um, the, the market for Braille and is creating demand for Braille. And we know this because of the uh, feedback from organizations like RNIB, who told us that we'd clean them out of all their uh, stock of the fingerprint uh, Braille course. I was really delighted about that, but I had to apologize to the product team. So uh, there is now fingerprint available again. There They've, they've made some more um, and also at one stage I think the Orbit Reader um, uh, low cost um, braille display was, was out of stock as well um, so we've been supporting people who perhaps have put braille down for a while or are looking to get back into it or maybe even start from scratch uh, and that really is the mission of the Braillers Foundation more braille yes supporting developers innovators and uh, technologists but also uh, supporting um, people like me uh, end users, readers, um, Braille, uh, blind people who can benefit from uh, Braille. So what next? Well, uh, I often think as I've grown the um, the Braillers Foundation as the you know as the, the chair um, of of JFK's famous quote, you know, it's not what uh, can can Braille do for me. What can I do? Um, for Braille. Well, of course, we want to uh, continue those um, collaborations. We've worked with uh, Tactile Times, um, a, a bunch of young people who put together a Braille newspaper um, during lockdown. They, in fact, have been nominated for RNIBC Differently Award. So uh, I would urge you to uh, to go and go and vote for that. Um, 
uh, we've also uh, worked with uh, the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, um, from whom we have um, received the grant, which is enabling us to um, pay uh, trainers um, to deliver sessions. So we've, we've so far done everything from, um, you know, Braille technology to how to use a slate and stylus, you know, the hand frame. So just because somebody has a smartphone in their bag, they might also have a, a, a pen and paper as well. And so I think it's, it's, it's very important to recognize the value of, of low tech as well. Um, so we are more active on uh, social media and we have also been distributing um, low cost Braille kit as well. We've been able to procure um, some low cost Braille equipment, which we are distributing in the UK and Ireland free of charge. Uh, so lots going on. You can find us online, braillists.org, uh, at braillists on the Twitter, or you can email help at braillists.org, and I'll be delighted to take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dave. That, a brilliant presentation. The Braillists are a great group. I had the pleasure um, of attending a number of their uh, Friday night sessions um, during the depths of uh, lockdown version one and afterwards, and a great group doing great work. So thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Dave. Now, we've heard three really great presentations. We've talked about the future of multi-line Braille and what a multi-line or multi-tactile Braille terminal might look like. We've heard all about some really great things happening in the world of accessible maths with Braille. And we've heard about the Braillists. And now it's time to hear your questions. Um, so we have about 25, 30 minutes to take your questions and we're looking forward to them. Could I please ask if you have a question that you would keep it as brief as possible so that we get as many people have a chance to ask questions as possible or make comments. And the man who manages that really well uh, is Carl Brealy. So we're gonna hand over to Carl, see how the chat is going and how the raised hands are going. So Carl, thank you very much. Sorry, I just had to cough right at the most appropriate <laughs> moments. Okay. Um, right, let's have a quick look for you. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Dum, dum, dum. Um, Derry Lawler's asked, what would the size of a single sheet Braille page be? A full cell focus takes up a bit of size. I'm assuming that's for you, Sheila. Sheila. Yeah, for yeah, the, for the, um, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're sort of working with. Uh, sort of a four equivalent size sheet approximately which is a, a little different in the us it's a little bit wider and a little bit shorter but it's about 32 characters wide by 26 lines so that would be for six dot and we're sort of um actually designing so that the rows and columns um fit in between so the braille gets a little bit resized in order to have the possibility of having equal spacing but it's approximately um uh, uh 32 cells per line and 26 lines per page. As it were. That then ties in with another question that's coming from Kowal. Um, yeah. She said, are you basing this on the Canute? No, it's, it's a different technology. The Canute is basically optimized for reading. Um, if you think of the Canute as the Braille equivalent of like a talking book machine, which is, uh, it's, it's brilliant for, for that. And, and it actually, um, so it, it, it is optimized just for lines. So they have a, um, a standard braille cell line. So we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so we're trying to make something that will work both for lines and graphics. So the dots and the rows and columns of our display are equally spaced. Yeah, it looks really good as well. Um, we, um, just from Doris, how did you show the blank spaces versus the black or dead space on your crossword? Yeah, now that's a, uh, so th that actually gets to the next question. I copied and pasted the questions out of the chat. So the graffiti, the, the device that we used, is um, made by the same company that make the little orbit reader, and it's a prototype device that they have. So that was somebody's question, is the graffiti software or, or hardware? So the graffiti is um, a, a piece of kit, um, and it weighs a ton, actually, but it has the ability to do different heights. So what we did was we used height to, to designate which cells were empty. So the empty cells were, uh, the dots were completely low. The cells that were blacked out, the dots were highest. And the, um, the ones that you could work with, the dots that you could work with, which are the ones, the cells that were currently empty, um, or sorry, um, that you had currently filled, they were kind of um, in between. 
So you could see immediately what the status of the individual cell was. And each cell was rep represented by one dot on the graffiti because the graffiti spacing, the dots are twice the size of Braille dots and the, they're uh, almost three times as far, you know, uh, three times distant from each other. So it's, it's like jumbo Braille effectively. So we couldn't put letters. We just had to have one dot per, per um, cell of the crossword puzzle. Brilliant. We're just going to run on to some um, hands. I will come back to the chat box in a second. Kerry. That's Kerry Doyle. And by the way, just after this, I, I have one email question that's come in that I'm just going to address. Maybe for Donald. <laughs> Sorry, Carol. Hi, Sorry, Carol. Hi, Kerry. Sorry, Carol. It was like, <laughs> unmute your audio, stay muted. I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Right. So, um, I was, one of the, I was going to be one of those really annoying people that had three questions, one for each person, that I thought, no, I'll just ask the two most important ones, maybe. Um, so one question is uh, for Donal. Um, do you see the implementation of the, the math um, uh, program, or I don't know what the right name is to call it, what you developed, do you see that lead into a scenario in the future whereby kids in... I guess, especially in Ireland, kids in mainstream would be taught um, in a class with all of their sighted peers, or do you still see that there would be a need for, um, you know, individual tuition, which is what I had when I was in mainstream? Um, and then my next question was for Dave um, about the um, the Braillist um, group. Um, I was wondering, Dave, do you know, can you still get, obviously you can still get the slate and styluses and can you get forward ones or do you always have to do it backwards <laughs> braille i mean okay let, uh, thanks kerry let's maybe go to donald first and then we go to dave if that's okay kerry good questions um i don't see this replacing individual tuition i think there's a role for both because one of the things that that did crop up when we were talking to people in the initial phase of the research was that because some of the, the blind students were actually been taken out of the class to study maths, they were losing out on what we would describe as peer learning and peer support. Mm. So that they would be, the, the, the issue fundamentally was that they were been taken off, shown how to do things in Braille, they'd come back in. And because they, it was been done very differently, yeah. they were in many cases not able to communicate mm. with their sighted yeah. other kids the same age. Yeah. So I think there's a role that's to be played, for example, when you've got to actually teach a blind child how to act to, 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 to write, to read UEB maths. There's definitely mm -hmm. a role for individual tuition. Yeah. But I think one thing we have to do is to, uh, to, to include in classrooms the ability to have peer support. So I, yeah. I, I think there's a role for both. Yeah. OK. OK, thanks very much, uh, Donald. Uh, and uh, Slate and Stylus, uh, Dave, can we are they available and how? Uh, what were you asking, Kerry? But yeah, but writing forward. I don't think you can do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks, Kerry. Um, lovely to hear you. Uh, the, you know, the fascinating thing is so many people uh, want the slates when you take them to shows because they've just not seen them before. And often students are not taught how to use them. Uh, and you're right, the traditional slate, you do write in, in reverse from the back. So you're pushing the dots up from uh, behind the, um, the piece of paper. And I do find that they are the most robust uh, slates and they are still available. Um, you can buy them from places like RNIB. Um, mm -hmm. If you write to the Braillists, uh, we'll send you one free. Um, this kind of mirrors what the um, National Federation um, for the Blind do in the States. Yeah, they have that's, a, a, yeah. A, a similar program. And that that's sort of right. partly inspired this. You know, I was really mm. keen that we shouldn't have mm. any barrier to someone yeah. at least being able to get like a, a pen and paper equivalent. Yes, um, yes. On, on your sort of second question, there are um, kind of forward writing slates available. My mm. experience has been that the dots are not as well formed so, okay. so yeah. when when I when I write with a regular <sighs> slate, you know, I use them for writing on taxi receipts and, and mm -hmm, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, mm. Just you know, when it seems like you know to unlock my phone and find the right place and put the information in there. Yeah. Um, actually, what I want to know is when I pull the piece of paper out of my wallet, as soon as I what touch is it, it, what is it? Yeah. 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 So yeah. so I'll put on a on a 
on a taxi receipt if I'm going to be claiming it, for example, as an expense, then uh, I, 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 that's the most common use I, I have for it. But there's lots of other uses as well. Um, there is a session. If you go to braillist.org slash media, um, mm -hmm. we've, we've produced a training session on how to use the slate. Um, okay. So those, those top down slates, the full ones, they are available, but I just don't. My experience no, hasn't fine. been great. I'll just, I'll just have to suck it up and learn. And I'm a fluent, <laughs> I'm a fluent braillist, so I just have to suck it up and stop being a baby. <laughs> You'll get that Basic, yeah. basically, yeah. Well, okay. or you could get a, a braille note taker. You know, I think it's good to have both. I, I, yeah. I mean, I just I can't afford a Perkins. I can't afford um anything like that. So just something uh, low tech, as you say. Sometimes low tech is good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you right. Know? And you can do you know writing envelopes, yeah. Christmas cards, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm... we get our Christmas card from Kerry, it'll be from the Slayton Styles. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Kerry. Okay. Thanks, Kerry. I uh, just want to really quickly mention an email, uh, maybe for Donal and Sheila I might like to comment on this, and it came from uh, Maeve Smith, who we all know, and Maeve is here today in the session, and she just makes a comment, or would like to pose a comment, um, she would like to ask about Braille music, its present position, and will it survive, and I suppose do the panelists have any comments or any thoughts, and I guess maybe in the context of some of the stuff we've been talking about today, Sheila, and I imagine when you were looking at at, at uh, what you're doing at the moment, maybe Braille Music was in your mind. Absolutely. And every chance I say Braille Music, Braille Music, Braille Music, it's a spatial code like math. So they, you know, I never mention one without mentioning the other. And actually, a lot of blind people in the States are um, wanting to learn Braille Music again, which is really great. The sad thing is there are a few people who teach it, but those of us who use it uh, do use it. So I think it's probably suffering from the fact that especially in the States, a lot of what gets taught depends on what the school districts will pay for, uh, more so than in the UK and Ireland. But I do think it's not gone yet. <laughs> and certainly in my mind, it's really important that these, um, these uh, systems... And I actually have a handy tech display, which I got from Germany, and I noticed they have Braille music as part of yes. one of the codes that you can enter. So yeah. it's still around, and we do, we do still think about it, and it's very important. And I, I, I imagine a day where I could actually sing from a Braille music score on one of my old, own displays. That's what I'm dreaming of. <laughs> Stuart, yeah. um, on Braille music, I have a couple of quick things. Yep. The um, International Council on English Braille at their recent General Assembly uh, had a whole day dedicated to the future of Braille music. Um, and all of that content was recorded and is available online um, so anyone interested in the future of braille music and some of the work that's going on in this area to preserve and protect and promote braille music uh, can find that out through the iceb.org uh, uh, website and, and go to the recent general assembly coverage and, and catch up on that there's about three hours of content and then this coming tuesday uh, which i think is the 20 help me out somebody um, 20, 20 24th, is it? 24th, I think, yeah. Is it? Yeah, okay. 24th, I'll take your word for yeah. it. Yeah, 24th, 7 30 in the evening. Um, the, the Braillists, uh, funnily enough, uh, are putting on a getting started with a Braille music session for anybody who's not done any Braille music and wants to give it a go. And uh, that'll be on, on Zoom as well. So you can find that on the Braillist.org site. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Stuart, could you share some URLs for people? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can I can pull this in an email, Stuart, and then if you want to send it um, out to everybody, we'll just well, quickly move on to the next question then, because I am a little bit. Um... Yeah. So just what just to say, uh, and we did get a question from um, Paul Leak as well, who's asking about could we share some information. So anybody who attended this session today, we will send out a follow up email uh, with all the information that was talked about today. Sorry, Carl. No, you will be. Um, right. We're just moving on to Adara Kabara. If you could unmute yourself, Adara. Hello. Hi, Adara. How are you? Hi. How's it going? Good. It was. It was just to reiterate the the, the question of um, whether can we have all the information on? Um, can we possibly have all the information about the the where, where all the links are? Yes. Yep. So we'll send out was, an email uh, later in the week with all the information. Okay. That was basically it, really. I think. I'm, Nice, brilliant. Pretty Thank much. you very much for that. Next, we've got Amy Stannard. Amy, it's all yours. Just need to unmute yourself, Amy. Hello. Hello, Hello Amy. Hello. 
mine, mine was just to um, base, uh, basically make a comment because I started Braille when I lost my sight in 19, so I was a lot later. And I could never, even though I had to use it in college, I always struggled to read it on, on the actual paper, and I still do. So that when they brought out like the Braille displays, even though it's still a, a, like a single cell, I found that much, much, much easier to read, especially if you've got joint problems and finger problems like I have. So I think the whole like the whole thing for the, for the new electronic braille and stuff has been for me a really big thing. Yeah, it's always interesting to talk to people about how they prefer to read braille, and I think sometimes it depends on the context and what you're reading. Whether you want to read on braille paper or or using technology, I don't know if any of the panel want to make any comments on that. I I'll, I'll take it, Stuart, because it's yeah. it's for, for me and you and I have actually had this conversation. There mm -hmm. are some displays which. Uh, doesn't matter which ones are which which ones are not but there are some displays where you just run your fingers across the dots and go i like the feel of that and then there's others it's 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 like a sighted person in a font yeah. you know a certain font or a certain type of screen or a certain type of anything else and you know there are some there are some sighted people who look at this, the, the, the screen on the phone and go i can read very easily on that and they look at another one and go i can't and it's it's i'm delighted this was actually brought up because it it really is subjective there's no there's no right way to do any of this kind of stuff. It's, 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 it's absolutely whatever suits the individual. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you very much, Donald. And thanks, um, Amy, for your question. Thanks very much. I was much. just going to ask, add one point, I think. Sorry, and um, David can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, braille, dispel, uh, braille cells in the US were slightly bigger than those in Europe. So maybe it's just that slight difference in size. If you happen to get a, a cell that's made by KGS or something, which is one of the biggest company that make them, they might just be a little bigger as well as the fact that the braille is more solid and, and doesn't tend to kind of get squished. If you can, I know it's difficult during um, lockdown, but if you can get your hands on a braille display before you, you know, really commit to it, um, I, I would strongly urge to, you to do that. You know, a sighted person probably wouldn't buy a screen without looking at it, you know, so... Totally agree. Just Brilliant. going to run Thanks back to the much. chat box quickly. Um, Donal, another Donal asked, is fingerprint available in soft copy? Uh, working on it. So not this second. Um, I'm trying to lobby internally to get that added to the library so that people can get it uh, digitally uh, without charge. So just leave that with me. I'm working on it. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Um, just another one. I think it's going to come for you, Dave. At Bucks Vision, we do get requests from customers who want to learn Braille. How could we go about helping them via the Braillist Foundation? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, point point people in in our direction if you like. We're just at the end of our first Braille for Beginners course. Uh, we haven't announced a second one yet, but I'm I'm fairly sure there will be uh, one. So if you have got people who want some some support with getting started with Braille, uh, we do have information on our website. And if you write to help at braillelists.org, uh, we can take that from there. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to get your name wrong now, and I do really apologise. Blathin, I don't expect that to actually be the right pronunciation. Um, just to basically a thank you. Great presentation. Very interesting. Wonderful work continues the progression and development of tactile and improved access information. I'm just well, going to... I'm just going to jump in here for a sec. That's uh, Blahin, uh, Blahin Gallagher, who has spent lots of years working in the uh, low vision and blind sector and has been involved in lots of projects around tactile access. I'm delighted to see Blahin here. So that was, I was almost right. That's all right. And it's just a big th well done to Sheila and Donald and Dave. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's just a little one from Kate Risden. If brown music dies, I won't have a life. Oh, there you go. Happy to teach anyone who wants it. So if anyone wants any free braille training, Get in touch with Kate, Kate Risden. She'll sort that out for you. Brilliant. Um, uh, and to saying hello to Kate. <laughs> yeah, and I want to give a big shout out to Kate as well because yeah. I put somebody in touch with her a few weeks ago. She is selfless in wanting to help people learn Braille music. So no, she, she is you, brilliant. Kate. She's been on quite a few times, hasn't she? So yeah. she is brilliant. Um, Manisha Patel, how to motivate a young adult to read Braille instead of using speech output from a brown note touch or any speech on a mobile phone? There's an interesting question for our panel. I don't know, uh -huh. Dave, maybe you, you might have come across this in the Braillists or maybe Donald, you, you've probably, I, I guess yeah. we've all had experience. It, well, indeed. And um, it, it, it is it is tough. Uh, I mean, the important thing, obviously, is to find content that inspires the student. You know, that is that is first and foremost, you know, who wants to read the cat 
it's out on the mat or whatever. And so um, there are publications from RNIB and others with, um, you know, straightforward um, articles uh, uh, that are in uncontracted Braille um, that you can get to uh, get you going. And, you know, it's it, the, the first thing is to find out what, what really fires them up. What is it that they are uh, motivated to do and use that as a kind of a hook to kind of lead them into, into Braille, I guess. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, just a last little one from Koal. Then I've, I've got a couple more hands. We will get through them all before we go. Um, I've been trying to get fingerprint download audio files to teach. I just moved completely where I was reading. Someone Braille, but it's difficult. So are there audio? So I, I, I yeah, guess right, the question is, are there audio files, files for fingerprint yeah. available, Dave? I, I presume that's the question. So the fingerprint course, it's a series of uh, hard copy books uh, and then it uh, yes, there are audio files that support the use of those um, books. Uh, and, and just on that, that sort of previous question about getting people inspired, I would also point out to that young person, um, the blind people who are successful. You know, we on the panel know anecdotally, at least, that Braille is strongly linked with, you know, independence and opportunity amongst um, blind and partially sighted people and actually it tends to be the blind people that have learned or used braille in some capacity tend to be more likely um, to, to get to where they want to get to in their career not exclusively but maybe it's just the circles in which I mix but if you think of write down the top 10 most famous blind people and then ask yourself how many of them use braille you know it doesn't feel like a coincidence to me brilliant thank you for that um, another quick one from Kate. Sorry, I love teaching, but I have to earn a living doing it. So please, can we get in touch about funding possibilities, especially for adults? It helps me pay the bills. Thank you for the plug. I'm absolutely passionate about getting musicians playing. Right, that's so, Kate, if you'd like to um, reach out to us, uh, I think we could probably have a conversation. Uh, we've got some uh, a limited amount of funding at the moment to, to deliver online Braille training. Uh, we're doing a, a absolute getting started with braille music on tuesday with james bowden who who i know you know um and uh, maybe we could have a conversation about identifying potential funding sources Brilliant. thank you mr brady chris brady it's all yours if you can just unmute yourself possibly uh, chris you just need to here we go chris, yeah. hello <clears throat> hi chris uh, i've got a couple of things to suggest to people Okay. Now, um, I teach I teach Braille um, in in Milton Keynes um, at uh, Sark, um, a, a sensory uh, assessment uh, resource centre. But I, I'm, I've also been doing it online uh, via Skype, and I have um, w when I had a couple of students that were um, they had. Uh, a bit of diabetic retinopathy, really, with the, with their fingers, uh, their, their their sensation, their feeling sensation was impaired. Um, I managed to teach one person Braille, but he couldn't actually read Braille. But he actually did it from memory, and he did do stuff with a Perkins. Um, but um, so I, I the thing is. Um, it, it can it can be done even even though people uh, may not be able to feel to read it. Um, but what I did use was a little cube, one of these little cubes that you can get from the RIB, and and I uh, because the, all the dots are numbered, um, I set the, uh, the the cube to the different uh, dots for the different characters, and he was able to see that or he was able to feel that as well, uh, and 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 that's the way he he, he learned his characters. Hello? Yeah? Yeah. Sorry, Chris. Now, so also, um, I believe um, that what should happen also is if you could get, you've got a little Oxford dictionary in the uh, Orbit Reader, which I, I teach as well. Now, if you get other, if you could get other dictionaries um, where you could actually type in and you can search for things like uh, language dictionaries, that would be a great help for people who are actually learning languages. Okay, Chris, we might pass that one back to Dave, and I'm just conscious there are other people waiting for no questions. If that's yeah, okay. I'll take so that back to RNIB. Yeah. yeah, 
Brilliant. Okay. And thank Chris, you, thank you for your question. Um, Kate, would you like to unmute yourself, my dear? There we go. Kate, hi, Kate. Okay. Okay, hi. Hello. Hi, Kate. Um, did you want me to, did you have a question you, for me? Or? You, you had your hand up, Kate. Oh, ages oh, and ages ago. I think it was uh, getting overexcited at what uh, Sheila was talking about, about brown music, I think. Um, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, no, I think we've probably covered everything. But um, the only thing I could add is that I've just had contact with a student who wants to learn Braille from um, Southern Ireland, who tried to get hold of fingerprint from RNIB, but couldn't because, of course, Southern Ireland is not... Um, it's not served any longer by, by RNIB as far as we know. And so um, I'm, I'm wondering about um, the, the resources availability for people who are not in the UK. Kate, if you'd like to ask the student for their permission or if you want to connect them with me, you can give mm -hmm. them my email address and I will help them get hold of, of it over here. It's quite possible she's on this webinar or we'll be listening at, at, at okay. a later date because I I flagged up this webinar to well, her if she, yesterday. If she would like to contact me, please feel free to pass my email address and we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you very much. George, if I could just come in very quickly, does somebody yep. just put in the chat that they actually got a copy to NCBI over here? <laughs> they will okay. be the same student. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Um, right, last question. We have got Nicola Dixon. So Nicola, if you could unmute yourself. Please. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Hi. Um, I just wanted to go back to the, the point that somebody made about trying to motivate young adults um, to read Braille. And, and, and it's a tricky one because, I mean, hard copy Braille is, by, um, is very bulky. Um, and, you know, if you're carrying stuff around, you, you don't want to be sort of hulking great big um, Braille um, books. I mean, when I was at school, all my stuff was hard copy uh, and because I attended a sighted school I was forever having to lug great big massive volumes of books between home and school and then somehow you'd find you'd not got the right volume um so I I can kind of sympathize and I think um the way I use braille I, I mean I do I I use speech a lot when I was doing my MA obviously a lot of stuff was was sent to me from for me to read and make notes on and I think if I try to read all that in braille it would have taken me an age um so I did use the speech for that for quick reading but I'd, I'd use the braille a lot for sort of close reading and for, for checking and spelling and especially if I'm filling something in on the internet and stuff like that so I think it, it, it's a tricky one um but that's 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 my take on it all really Thank you. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks a million. Brilliant. Um, let me just get rid of that one. That one. Just That's on it. That. Stuart, I think it's just important to say that, um, you know, Braille uh, is obviously very relevant um, for those of us on the panel. And we've all got a, a task to do, I think, in, in terms of outreach uh, to help um, others appreciate the relevance of Braille, not just, you know, for the, um, the sort of, the, you know, the academic things, but just day to day stuff, labeling and, you know, I mentioned greetings cards. And, you know, for me, it was reading the bedtime story with my, my son. So it's uh, you know might be playing board games or, or card games or you know finding those those sort of killer tasks you know killer applications as we say in this kind of the software uh, world that really make braille relevant for that particular individual absolutely and it um it kind of brings to mind a story i remember talking to a lady a number of years ago who was keen to learn braille but didn't really know what she would use it for and um we kind of discovered during conversations that she likes to cook and she had lost her sight recently and she couldn't now, she wasn't sure what spices she had. And we realized if she just learns Braille to label her spices, that was a good start. So it's exactly as you say, to give somebody a reason to make that first step. Best tip I learned this year, Stuart, was uh, I learned to bake uh, bread during uh, lockdown. Uh, and the best tip I learned this year was actually from my, uh, from my wife, who suggested actually you can use your Braille display in the kitchen. You just put it inside a sandwich bag first. Well, Dave, maybe you'd like to send some bread over to the uh, the webinar Wednesday, people. We won't say no. 
there you go. So thank you. But very yep, much. your braille display will work in a, in a sandwich bag, so you can use it in the kitchen. Okay, great, great tip there. Top tip from the kitchen. Uh, okay, I think that's it, Carl. Just last check. There's no more hands. Hey, we're all done. All done. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much to our three uh, our three panelists today. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. It's given me a lot to think about. I think it's just wonderful presentations, and it's great to know that. A, there's so much happening in the background in regard to the future of Braille, and B, there is so much on the ground right now, and there are so many people willing to help those who want to use Braille. So lots of stuff out there. That's all from Webinar Wednesday for this session. For those who are coming back later, we are back at 7 o'clock talking about all this new and JAWS. Uh, Carl and myself will be back, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone then. Until then, from Stuart Lawler, thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Again, thank you so much to our panellists. And uh, we look forward to talking to you all soon. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.